Hey guys, Brian from Brian Boas here. Well, my 2022 locality boa breeding season is off to a great start. Today I'm going to give you guys an update on how things are going so far. I'm going to show you some of the boas that I hope to produce in 2022, like this one, and say a little bit about how you can acquire a boa if you are interested. So be sure to stay tuned. So I started my breeding season, as you may recall, back in November. I started uh, lowering the temperatures in my enclosures and basically I dropped it about 15 degrees Fahrenheit over about two to three weeks in starting in uh, early November. Around mid-November, mid to late November, I started pairing up my animals and I kept them together until uh, just about a week ago. The temperatures stayed reduced that night, about 15 degrees, until around uh, mid-January, early to mid-January. That's when I started increasing the temperatures again. And then I ramped them up slowly over about two weeks. And so I separated the animals just a week ago. I fed them all. And just yesterday and continuing to today, I'm repairing them up. And so basically that's the first stage of my breeding. You know, I have the animals together when the temperatures are dropping at night. They stay together for about two and a half months. And so then after that, what I'll do is I'll keep them together for about a month at a time. And then I separate them for a week. I feed them and then I put them back together. Uh, and I repeat this process until either the females are obviously gravid and showing all the signs of being gravid or I reach maybe May or June and you know at that point it's probably not going to happen that year so I just wait till the next year. So so far so good. I would say that of my pairs I probably have seen you know definite breeding activity in about two-thirds of them. Uh, right you know this year I have a record number of pairings and so I'm really excited about the possibilities you know a lot of uh, first-time pairings for me and it's always very exciting to have a pairing for the first time and produce a different boa for the first time so really looking forward to that so in about two-thirds of my pairings I've definitely seen signs the male is interested and you know typical uh, typical signs I'll see the male is basically uh, sitting on top of the female with his head kind of lined up with hers and his body is parallel to her body and then he's got his tail kind of wrapped around her tail at the base trying to bring you know his cloaca right in close proximity to her cloaca and so the males will sit like this some of them will just basically not move for days I mean I go in every day they're still in the same position tail wrapped around so a lot of people see this and they think, well, they're, they're mating. But really, you rarely see the boas mate. Basically, what you're seeing is the courtship behavior. And, you know, the female or the male has his tail wrapped around. He's definitely trying to mate, but it doesn't necessarily mean that he's mated yet or the female has allowed him to mate. But it, it definitely is a good sign. So if you're breeding, uh, you, if you see this, it's a good sign. But, you know, people, I'll see comments on the... Uh, Boa groups on Facebook, people have a picture of the tails are wrapped and they're, they're saying it's a lock or they're mating. But most of the time, that's not an actual copulation. The, you know, the hemipenes aren't inserted into the female. And that's really what you need to make the baby boas. So if you see that, it's great, but don't disturb them. Just keep them together. You want to make absolutely sure you give them every chance, you know, to mate. And just because they're showing signs of breeding activity doesn't mean they mated yet. You know, the male can court the female for months at a time uh, before actual mating occurs. So that being said, uh, you know, uh, a lot of my pairs are showing the signs of mating. Um, I would say uh, there's about a third of them. I'm not really seeing much signs yet. And it seems like a lot of my dwarf boas this year, for some reason, like my tar humars and Kwaki and Kakriki, they're not really showing that much signs of mating yet. But, you know, it might be that they're not going to mate until the spring, you know, after the temperatures warm up. So, you know, just give them the space that they need to do their thing and, you know, let nature take its course and hopefully I'll have, uh, you know, a lot of nice, really nice babies. My general philosophy with breeding boas, as you, I'm sure you've realized if you've been watching the channel for very long, is that I do everything I can to get the pairs ready in an optimal breeding shape. But then when it comes time to breeding, they're on their own. And you know, I really try to give them a lot of space to do their thing. You know, I don't interfere with them very much. I might check in, you know, take a quick look once, twice a week. You know, certainly when I'm doing my weekly uh, maintenance of each enclosure, I make a note of what's going on 
But in general, I don't uh, interfere with them, and I, I feel like the more that someone interferes, the less likely they're gonna do their thing and make the babies. So I don't usually take a lot of pictures of boas that are mating or post pictures online or things like that. Um, I also don't really carefully monitor the females, and I know a lot of people monitor the females every day and they see when there's like the pre-ovulation swell and the, they try to predict when it's gonna be ovulating and things like that. I don't do that and often I don't see my animals ovulate. You know, the ovulations in many locality boas are pretty subtle anyway. So I'd rather just let them do their thing, not interfere and let nature take its course. Um, of course, I monitor for the post-ovulation shed. You know, if I see a female that's going into a shed cycle, I'll write that down because typically the shed cycle for the uh, post-ovulation shed, it takes about a week and a half or so. It's about twice as long as a regular shed cycle. And then of course I need to know, um, you know, the post-ovulation shed so that I can predict when the uh, litters, uh, the babies are due to be born. So um, when I separated out the females, you know, just last week, there were a few that looked like you know promising as far as you know definitely thicker maybe they're maybe if they're ovulating maybe it's a pre-ovulation swell they might even be gravid by now but again i don't really uh interfere with them that much and i let nature take its course typically if a female's gravid she's going to show a lot of signs you know which i've discussed in a previous video and the male is going to stop showing interest so i just kind of wait around until i'm really positive that she is gravid and typically I'll leave the male in for like an extra month anyway just to make sure you know it, it can't hurt uh, and sometimes you know I've taken out the male too soon and maybe I would have been successful had I left the male in a little bit longer and so um, when I did these breeding videos in the past in previous years I used to take the camera and I'd go from enclosure to enclosure and try to catch some signs of mating. But this year I decided I'm not gonna do that because again, I don't wanna disturb my animals any more than absolutely possible. And you know, my enclosures are kind of dark, so I'd have to bring my lights and that, you know, it's gonna uh, disturb them even more. And most of the time there's really not much to see anyway. It's just the male is kind of on top of the female with his tail wrapped around hers. So I decided for this year's updates, I'd rather than show you a breeding pair, I'm going to show you guys some babies that I produced in the past and that I have paired up this year. So this will give you an idea of some of the animals I hope to produce in 2022. And this first one is a Pearl Island boa. This female was born here in 2019, so she's going on two and a half years old. And this is a really cool type of locality boa. Definitely different from most other boas. More elongated and you know built for life in the trees. Really cool head shape as well. They're also very active. They're a lot. They move around a lot more than other boas. So if you're looking for something a little bit different, you know these Pearl Island boas are really cool boas. You know they're not the most docile and handleable though. So if you just want a pet, they're probably not your best choice. But if you want a dip boa that's a little bit different, so. I produced the litter of these last year, and so I have a different female this year with my same male. These are um, Rio Bravo bloodline animals produced by Vin Russo, and so looking good so far. And these guys, um, in my experience, they've been my first or one of my first animals to give birth. In fact, uh, last year I had my litter was born in May. You know, so fingers crossed we might have some of these beautiful Pearl Island boas on the ground. You know, April May, ish. Uh, maybe June, we'll just have to see. But hopefully we'll have some of these really cool boas available. And I've been getting a lot of questions from you guys about boa availability. Um, so I'll say a little bit more about that uh, in a few minutes. So be sure to stay tuned and see the rest of these beautiful boas. Of course, I have quite a few red tail, two red tail pairings this year, boa constrictor, constrictor. And these are kind of my bread and butter. And so one of my favorites, of course, is the Peruvian. This is a Pacalpa Peruvian boa that was born here in 2020. So she's about uh, a year and a half or so at this point. Um, hoping to produce my first litter of Iquitos Peru boas. Have a beautiful pair of Iquitos paired up as well as my Pacalpa animals. So I've got the same pairing going this year that produced this one. So this was a Rio Bravo bloodline male with a Jim Peters bloodline female. And I just, you know, really love the thin saddles and the, the beautiful colors on this one. 
uh, hopefully we'll repeat the 2020 litter in 2022 and have some that uh, look kind of like this. And of course I have several Suriname boa constrictor constrictor pairs as well. Um, this is an example of a male I produced last year from my Prometheus bloodline. I've got some Prometheus animals paired up again this year, including the male that produced this one. So they will have, hopefully we'll have some half siblings to this guy available. I've also got my other main bloodline, so lots of great variety in my Suriname pairings this year. And I've even got some unrelated ones, some new bloodlines that I acquired as babies and I've been growing up all the years to introduce into my breeding. So really excited about the Suriname, you know, uh, prospect for 2022. Hopefully I'll have some multiple litters of these beautiful classic Suriname red tail boas. I have several really cool island boa pairings this year, uh, including hog island boas. And I didn't produce any hog island boas uh, in 2021, unfortunately, although I had produced these guys uh, for the previous few years. So i trying a different male this year. Um, hopefully I'll be more successful. This is one that uh, was born in 2019. And so this animal was a Sears bloodline male from Vin Russo Cross with a female that I got from um, Ron Greenberg from Ron's Reptiles. And I really like this combination, just uh, lots of color, lots of greens and pinks and oranges, um, a lot of speckling as well. Just a really cool look. So I've got my, my female is paired up actually with a younger animal from the uh, Sears bloodline. So my Ron Greenberg female that produced this one with a younger male from the uh, Sears bloodline that was also born here. So fingers crossed on that one. This, the male is a little bit young, but you know, hopefully it'll be successful. We'll just have to see, uh, but I hope to produce some of these hog island boas here in 2022. Another island boa for 2022 is the Qual Key boa. And these are one of the smallest locality boas with adults being in the four to five foot range. Uh, these guys have really grown on me over the years and you know they're one of my favorite uh, boa localities at this point. Just love their great coloration and their cool markings and their size is really great and also they're great to handle you know because they have a kind of a good feel in the hand so to speak. You know they hold on but they don't squeeze too tight but uh, just a really cool boa to work with. Um, this one was born here in 2020 and so she's about not quite a year and a half old. I actually have the exact same pairing this year and so the pairing is a they're both Rio Bravo bloodlines. The female came from Gus Renfro himself, one of my older animals, and the male actually came from Michael Beach but from Rio Bravo bloodlines. So hopefully I'll have some animals that look kind of like this, you know, full siblings to this one. And it is a proven pair, so hopefully we'll be successful again and have some of these uh, beautiful crawl key boas available in 2022. One more dwarf boa that I really enjoy working with is the Tar Humara Mountain Boa from Northern Mexico. And this is a female that was born here in 2018. So fingers crossed I'll have a litter of these guys this year. I didn't have a litter last year, unfortunately. I think my male is getting a little bit old. My, you know, my original male. This year I have some F1s that I'm pairing up uh, that were born here in 2017. So hopefully those guys are, you know, a little bit younger and they'll be uh, you know, more fertile than my original pair. Um, so far, you know, I haven't really seen a whole lot of activity from these guys, but you know, maybe they just need a little bit more time. And some boas don't really mate that much until the spring warm up. So got to give them a little bit more time and we'll see what happens. But uh, as you probably know, I'm a big fan of these dwarf boas. They're the smallest type of boa, locality boa, getting to be anywhere from about three and a half to about four and a half feet. Really beautiful to look at, beautiful dark colors, but lots of subtle pinks and uh, sometimes even greens and blues, lots of cool colors to them. Um, enjoyable to handle, you know, they don't move around a whole lot, but they do interact with the keeper. So just a great boa for someone that doesn't have a lot of space, but really wants a cool boa pet. Um, so we'll have to see, you know, hopefully I'll have some of these Tar Humara Mountain Dwarf Boas uh, sometime this summer. 
And one more locality boa I hope to produce in 2022 are the long tail boa or boa constrictor longicata like this one. 2021 was the first year I produced these, so I was you know, super excited about that. This is one of my holdback females, so she's about six months old now. Still pretty tiny, but you know, not nearly as tiny as when she was born. You know, these could well be the smallest boas at birth. You know, I think that either these or the Tarhumaras are the smallest uh, in my experience. But you know, this one's put on a few inches since she was born. They're doing real well. This is a Beset bloodline. Uh, this year, I actually have a different bloodline. I have uh, some uh, uh, Vin Russo bloodline animals produced by Sonia Komu. And these animals are supposedly hat for anorithristic. So fingers crossed we'll get some anorithristic uh, longicata boas as well as the normals like this one. But just a really cool mid-sized locality boa. Um, when they get bigger, they get a lot darker. So this animal is gonna have a lot more dark pigment as an adult. Uh, the, you know, the babies don't really look a lot like the adults. So when you see the babies, you wanna check out some pictures of adults so you know what your baby is gonna look like as an adult. And I've done videos on these in the past showing both babies and adults. You know, so check them out if you're interested in the longicata. But this is a great boa. Um, kind of has a cult following. A lot, there's some people out there that just really love these animals and they just focus solely on the longicata boas, but uh, they have a lot to offer for a boa keeper. So that was a few of my babies from previous years. And, you know, again, I hope to produce, uh, in some cases, full siblings to the animals I showed you. Um, I expect that babies will start to be born probably sometime around May or June. And then typically July and August are the busiest months. August is typically when the red, true red tails start being born. Um, typically, it, I'll, you know, true red tails will continue into September, sometimes even October. Um, and that's when they're born. My animals are not ready to go right after they're born. I have to establish them, get them feeding, make sure everything's okay before they go to new homes. Uh, typically that takes about two months after they're born. And then um, at that point, they'll be available for sale. So I've been getting a lot of questions from you guys about acquiring boas. How do I buy one of your boas? Where do you sell your boas? Uh, so a few question, answers to those questions. I don't take deposits. I don't do waiting lists. Um, I just found it hasn't been productive in the past to do that kind of thing. I just really want to focus on producing my boas before I worry about selling them. So once they're ready to go, uh, typically I'll do videos about available boas. So, you know, stay tuned to this channel for those videos. In the past, sometimes I've, I've put boas up for sale on Fauna Classified. So you can go there and uh, check out the boas I have for sale and the information about them. Um, and it's really a, a first come first serve basis. I know a lot of people are interested in these and I, I don't think it's fair to do waiting lists and to you know, compile a list of people months ahead. And you know, often when I tried this in the past, I would reach out to the people and then they either weren't interested anymore or I just never heard anything back. So it was just a kind of a waste of everyone's time. Um, but I expect that the boas will start to be for sale up around July or August. And then the sales will continue, you know, till November-ish. Typically December is January, it's getting a little too cold to ship. So then I uh, postpone the remaining sales until the spring. And in fact, I have a few animals left from 2021, some true red tails and a few others. Um, that I'm going to be selling in the spring. So stay tuned if you want an animal that's already on the ground and ready to go. If you don't want to wait around until the summer or fall, uh, I'll have a few animals a little bit sooner than that. But again, just stay tuned to this video, this channel for upcoming videos to go over available boas. You know, this is one of the reasons I set up this channel was so I could communicate to people uh, practically in real time what I have available. Uh, and so you can also see animals on video that are available you know, hopefully it will help you make a more informed decision when it comes to acquiring new boas for your collection. So I hope this video was helpful. Um, as always, shoot me any questions or comments you have, and I expect to make additional update videos about every month and a half or so, you know, as things are developing. Um, hopefully I will have some definites as far as what animals are gravid starting around, I don't know, March, April. I have a pretty good idea. 
you know, one question I forgot to discuss is a lot of people asking me, well, what looks good? You know, what's gravid? I really don't know at this point. You know, I have my fingers crossed and I'm hoping for certain things, but I can't really say at this point, you know, that's part of the fun of breeding boas. It's like you're a kid on Christmas morning. You never know exactly what's going to happen. You know, it can be disappointing sometimes, but sometimes you're just really rewarded and it's, you know, the best thing ever. So anyway, I hope you liked the video. Uh, thanks for watching and enjoy your boas.